Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere! Astăzi am onoarea să vă prezint un interviu realizat cu profesorul Daniel Dennett, unul dintre cei mai importanți teoreticieni ai filozofiei minții, care a vizitat de două ori România, prima dată în 1990, imediat după Revoluție, iar a doua oară în vara anului 2011, când i s-a acordat titlul de Doctor Honoris Causa al Universității București. Daniel Dennett este profesor de filozofie la Universitatea Tuft din Massachusetts, și director al Centrului de Studii Cognitive. S-a remarcat prin contribuții fundamentale în filozofia contemporană, în domenii precum filozofia științei, științele cognitive, filozofia minții și teoria evoluționistă. Pe parcursul studiilor, Daniel Dennett a avut ocazia să-l întâlnească și să lucreze cu unii dintre cei mai influenți filozofi și logicieni americani ai secolului 20. În 1963 și-a luat diploma în filozofie la Universitatea Harvard. În cariera sa academică a ocupat succesiv diverse poziții la universități prestigioase, precum California, Harvard și Oxford. Din 1975 este profesor la Universitatea Tufts. A publicat numeroase cărți pe diverse teme, de la religie, la evoluție și la cunoaștere. Printre cele mai importante lucrări amintim Conținut și conștiință, eseu filozofic despre minte și psihologie, Conștiința explicată, Feluri de minți, Creierul copiilor, un eseu despre configurarea minților și evoluția libertății. Daniel Dennett face parte dintre susținătorii orientării evoluționiste în înțelegerea gândirii și a comportamentului uman. Multe dintre ideile sale fac parte din avangarda filozofiei minții și dau naștere la controverse și modele alternative de explicație. El este un susținător al modelului neurocomputațional al minții umane, considerând că liberul arbitru, poate coexista cu determinismul cognitiv. Celor care nu aderă prea bine la această teorie le răspunde prin, citez, dacă oamenii sunt convinși că nu există liber arbitru, atunci ei ar putea crede că responsabilitatea este un mit. Daniel Dennett mai adaugă faptul că dacă individul nu deține controlul conștient asupra acțiunilor sale, orice atribuire a vinovăției legale sau morale devine problematică. Așa cum declara în timpul cuvântării omagiale, filozofia trebuie să ridice în mănușa provocărilor la intersecția dintre etică și știință. Am avut parte și de data aceasta de o calitate foarte bună a imaginii și a sunetului, dar dincolo de aspectul tehnic, discuția cu Daniel Dennett, concepută în baza a 22 de întrebări, mi-a adus noi înțelegeri asupra vieții și gândirii umane, parcurgând etape ale evoluției gândirii umane din timpul străvechi până în prezent alături de evoluția comportamentului social și mai mult am lămurit un aspect deseori confuz legat de darwinism și anume faptul că unii au crezut multă vreme că teoria evoluționistă a lui Darwin s-ar regăsi la nivel social la fel ca în regnul animal și atunci din acest motiv ar considera darwinismul ca fiind dăunător societății și științei. Dar Darwin nu a afirmat nicăieri faptul că societatea umană s-ar supune sau ar trebui să se supună unei legi drastice de selecție a celui mai adaptat. Deoarece, aflându-ne pe un alt nivel de evoluție decât animalele, societatea umană poate evolua pe baze raționale și cooperante. Există nuanțe între ceea ce spunea la Marc, adică comportamentele s-ar transmite genetic, ceea ce nu e adevărat, deoarece ele se transmit memetic, adică prin meme, ceea ce ne transmite profesorul Dennett, ceea ce mi-a explicat Howard Bloom și ceea ce spunea Bruce Lipton în interviul de anul trecut. Trebuie să adaug faptul că, spre deosebire de Lawrence Krauss, profesorul Dennett explică fenomenul religios cu totul altfel și consideră că religia poate face parte din curicula școlară în anumite condiții de prezentare și predare non-dogmatice pe care le au și celelalte materii de studiu, subliniind faptul că orele de religie pot fi de asemenea dedicate cu succes prezentării unui bagaj cultural inedit, precum muzică, artă, istoria religiilor și toată lumea ar avea de câștigat. Dear Professor Daniel Dennett, welcome to our program Science and Knowledge for the first time in Romania. I'm delighted to be with you electronically. It is a great privilege for me to have this conversation with you and I watch some of your conferences on the internet and they are fascinating, inspiring and they are opening our view in order to have a better understanding of life. Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'd like to add that before we begin, 
please feel free to cover each topic with the necessary amount of information. It is not important the number of questions that I had prepared, so if there is not enough time to answer all of them, that is no problem. We can continue them with another occasion if you agree. Okay. I, I can't promise that. Uh, my time is very short, but let's go. Maybe once per year? Maybe, yes. Okay, that would be great. Please make a comment of the essence of your book and tell us why religion is a natural phenomenon. This is the title of your book. Yeah. The world has seen religions grow and shrink and change tremendously in the last uh, century, in the last few decades. and. I wanted to look at the phenomena from a purely empirical, scientific, secular point of view, uh, the same way we would look at economic phenomena or uh, climate change or uh, uh, energy policy or water. Uh, this is a series of worldwide phenomena that need to be examined with all the tools of investigation that are available to us. And the problem is that traditionally we have exempted religion from that sort of scrutiny. We've treated it with, uh, uh, with kid gloves, as we say. We've, uh, we've pampered it. We've al allowed it to draw veils in front of its uh, activities. No more. This, it's too important to permit that kind of covert uh, activity. <clears throat> so we need to look very closely at religion uh, as, as we look at other important phenomena. Now, that was the point of the title of my book, Breaking the Spell, that we, we simply abandon the tradition of uh, not looking too closely at religion. I think we should look closely at everything religious. Uh, it's pretty clear, I think it shouldn't be controversial, that, that religion is a natural phenomenon. Uh, it obeys the laws of physics. The, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the church's uh, fabric require engineering just the way banks and bridges do, the churches themselves do, uh, and the social sciences uh, are good at accounting for the uh, various phenomena that we see. So then we even want to look at it from a, uh, the, the rise of religion from a biological point of view, because it's an unusual biological phenomenon. A tremendous amount of energy and time are devoted to religious ceremony and uh, uh, ritual, uh, which one wants to know um, what pays for this? What? Um, it, it's not like laying up food. It's not like building defenses against uh, uh, armies of the uh, from outside. It's a it's a unique set of human activities, and we want to know why it why it survives, why it thrives. Um, in general, uh, phenomena don't remain part of the culture unless they are providing some benefit to the culture, or at least people think they're providing some benefit. So it's, these are questions that we need to look at. One possibility is that religions used to provide a benefit, but no longer do. But we are having trouble uh, curtailing them, eradicating them, making them go extinct. Uh, which is what many people think they deserve to go extinct. Maybe they have become a, a parasitic phenomenon, not a, not a beneficial one. Yeah, I totally agree with you. But, uh, but 
Are we just hardwired to believe in an invisible person? Well, we have hardwiring which makes that belief likely under some circumstances. It seems to me quite clear that one of the uh, main sources of belief in gods and other supernatural entities is an orientation reflex which is hardwired in us. Uh, when we're startled or when we see something puzzling or confusing, sudden motion that we don't understand and don't expect, our immediate reaction is to orient to it uh, defensively and to basically ask ourselves, who's there? Who, who made that noise? Not what is it, but who is it? We, we are biased in favor of discovering another agent, another, uh, another person, a wild animal, uh, uh, some thing that we have to deal with uh, defensively, because it may be, maybe what it, what it, what it is is a, a person when what it wants is you. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a predator, or maybe it's a potential mate, or maybe it's a, a, a something to eat. And this is a, an instinct, a bit of hard wiring we share with many animals, with basically all mammals, and also with, uh, uh, with birds and, and with fish, for instance. Um, and it makes good evolutionary sense. Uh, but in us, we have an, another amazing phenomenon is language, which only our species has. So that although your dog may be startled by a puzzling noise coming out of the bush and may growl and may do an orientation response, uh, uh, it's going to investigate to see what's there. When it discovers that it's just the blowing wind or something, then it calms down. It doesn't dwell on it. Whereas we uh, elaborate in our imagination what we think we saw and our incessive echoing minds create basically hallucinations of agents that were never there. And pretty soon we're, we've convinced ourselves, we've talked ourselves into the idea that we're in the presence of uh, very remarkable agents that can disappear, that can fly, that, that uh, they're not like you and me, and maybe they're dangerous or maybe they're good for us. But pretty soon we have all these uh, themes in our mind about, about these uh, remarkable invisible agents. And when we share them with our friends, they get elaborated. And pretty soon everybody in the village is talking about the, uh, the talking tree or, or uh, the bird that bursts into flame or some other amazing thing. And lesser stories, lesser fantasies are less interesting. They're more forgettable. So they don't survive. So there's a competition, a sort of Darwinian competition for the most um, attention-holding, exciting, uh, mystifying, uh, tantalizing, uh, invisible agents. That creates the... Uh, leprechauns and gnomes and fairies and elves and trolls, all the imaginary little gods and goddesses of the uh, fantasy world. And I think that the great monotheistic religions are simply direct descendants of those. And related to this topic, why so many esoteric groups and schools want to always have a very near end of the world scenario instead of dealing with uh, what they claim to teach others. 2012 came and went and nothing happened. Well, um, it's not hard to see what the attraction of a fantasy about the end of the world can be. Um, if uh, 
if your life trajectory is either tedious or terrible, uh, disappointing, frustrating, um, the fantasy of something catastrophic happening to change your life for the better, the world's going to end, and, but I'm not going to end. I'm going to be one of the chosen. I am going to uh, ascend into heaven and, and enjoy a, a fantastic life ever after. Uh, it's almost comically obvious why this would be appealing. And so you might think that people would see through it. They would know better than to fall for it. But if you have the right charismatic leader and people are disturbed and frustrated and anxious enough, it turns out to be relatively easy to persuade them that this is what the future holds. And they become so convinced of it that when, when the uh, second coming doesn't happen, when Armageddon doesn't happen on yet another predicted day, people say, well, okay, we got the prediction wrong, but it's still going to happen, it's just not right now. It's a transparently irrational, um, but it works. Yes, unfortunately. But why so many people cannot have a normal life without predictability? And even more, this predictability should be always be apocalyptic and never something beautiful. Well, yes, that's, um, it's a curiosity. I think we could go through the uh, menagerie of strange beliefs that various cults and religions have and find what makes them attractive in every case. I've never seen one that struck me as really insoluble. Um, it's, they're quite direct reflections of human yearnings. Please tell us about an article published by you and Linda Lascola in Evolutionary Psychology, Volume 8, March 2020, entitled Preachers Who Are Not Believers. What kind of questions did you ask and what were the answers? Yes, we um, surmised, we guessed that there were pastors, clergy, preachers who were still preaching faith from the pulpit, but that no longer had that faith, that no longer believed. They were being monumentally insincere, hypocritical, and uh, preaching what they didn't believe anymore. And we located some um, and interviewed them clandestinely, that is, in confidence uh, and in depth for hours. And uh, the, Linda Lascola did those interviews. And we now have several dozen cases that we've studied carefully. And in every case, the person went into uh, the ministry with a fairly clear view and uh, a sincere desire to do good by preaching the Word of God. When they get inside and see the machinery of what makes a church work and learn some of the hypocrisies of, uh, of the doctrines, they uh, have a lot of serious doubts. And if they go to leave the church, they're usually counseled not to do that and urged not to do that. And uh, really very sternly compelled to stay in the church, the idea is until their faith comes back. But their faith doesn't come back. <laughs> and years pass, and it becomes worse and worse. And there's no dividing line there, so they, they find themselves on this gradual, slippery slope into utter dissembling, completely dishonest behavior as ministers, but they got there by imperceptible small steps that were in themselves benign and meant well. And it's a, a, it's a 
truly fascinating case of um, of people being led with people with very good motives being led by tiny degrees into a more and more desperately hypocritical situation. Can you give me some examples of questions and answers? Oh, the, in the interviews. Well, yes. Um, we first find out their 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 history, their how they got into religion, what their family's religious practices were, what happened when they went to seminary to get trained, and the stories differ on all of these dimensions. But when they come out, they are still religious to some degree and sometimes very strongly religious. Uh, we have both um, fundamentalists, evangelicals, people that are devout and are very literal about the Bible. And then we have people that are very liberal about that. And they all... Uh, stay with the program, but it's much harder for the uh, literal ones, the radically uh, evangelical ones. It's a much harder life for them because the, the literal truth of the creed plays a big role in their, in their self-image. Um, so we, we find the group of them very sympathetic and uh, fascinating. So we have a book out about it called uh, Caught in the Pulpit, uh, Leaving Belief Behind. And uh, it's quite a moving read. Yes, and thank you very much. Can you explain to our viewers what is consciousness and if there is any real difference between the mind and the consciousness and What is the multiple drafts model of consciousness? Well, consciousness is another material physical phenomenon. It's a natural phenomenon. It does not involve ectoplasm or any immaterial soul stuff. Um, we don't have souls that are like traditional Christian souls that are eternal immaterial entities That, that's a, a, an obsolete myth. We, have, um, uh, we do have organizations in our brain. We do have uh, systems of organization in the nervous system, among the nerves and the neurons that govern our behavior, that determine how we behave and how we think and how we decide. And the, those structures do endow us with the traditional powers of free will. So we are responsible. That is, if we're normal human adults, we make decisions consciously. And when we do, we can defend them. And uh, even if they are determined, uh, as they are for all practical purposes, they're free in a more important sense, namely that they are the result of thinking and decision-making that has uh, surveyed the circumstances and is choosing the best option, all things considered. Please talk us about free will, or maybe the illusion of free will, and give us an example for a better understanding. Um, free will is not an illusion, or if it is, then many things in life are illusions that we don't usually think of as illusions. Um, is the equator an illusion? It's, it doesn't weigh anything, but it's a perfectly uh, objective fact that there is where it runs. It's a, it's a, it's a mathematical object, an abstraction. But it's not an illusion. Uh, are dollars or euros illusions? No, they're not. 
they're not dollar bills, they're not dollar coins, they're, they're made of information. They're completely abstract, but they're not illusions. Uh, and the, uh, the self is not an illusion, and free will is definitely not an illusion. Some people really have free will, and others don't. And it's an objective fact that we can determine. We can uh, test people to see whether they have the sort of freedom to choose the sort of uh, spontaneity and uh, rationality that uh, is required for free will. So I say free will is not an illusion. People who say that have in mind that if determinism is true, then, we, then free will must be an illusion. But that's because they accept a, an ancient and traditional view of what free will is that needs to be replaced. Um, what we want to say is free will isn't what people used to think it is, but it's real. It's just different from what you thought. Can you tell us the difference between memes and genes? Um, Richard Dawkins introduced the term meme as the name of items of culture which replicate according to Darwinian natural selection. So this is evolution by natural selection, but not of DNA genes and not of, hence not genetic evolution, but cultural evolution. Um, he pointed out that this was a theoretical possibility because there was nothing in Darwin's theory that singled out why you had to use something like DNA as the carrier of information. Um, it turns out that the best example, for instance, of memes are words. They have histories there. There's new words and old words. The old words have not been recently coined. In fact, they were never coined. They've emerged from proto-language um, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago. And uh, they, have, they have the features they have today because those have evolved by natural selection and not genetic selection. There's no genetic selection, selection of genes. There are no genes for English or Romanian or Russian or Spanish. There are genes for making our brains uh, good word processors, good, good language processors. But those, uh, the genes that do that don't also sculpt the words that we speak. The, those are sculpted by uh, human interaction, and the result is a specification of a word, which is not itself in terms of nerve activity, but in terms of the meaning and pronunciation of the word. So, um, words evolve to fit in human brains, and then brains evolve genetically to be better havens for words. And then using words, we can say anything we want to, which is a, a lot of things that can be said, and they are uh, made possible by a set of rules that determine how the parts can be put together grammatically to make, um, to make semantically meaningful sentences. So memes, like genes, are information carriers. Like genes, they are highly replicatable. Um, like genes, there can be selection that is interfered with or modulated by the activity of organisms. So that um, just as we've domesticated cows and dogs and sheep and horses, we've also domesticated a lot of memes uh, by 
making them words in our language and getting them to uh, obey our wishes more or less. There are other memes which are not which are wild and uh, um, some of them are actually harmful. So would that be something similar just as like our genes are hardwired in our cells? The memes are hardwired in our brain or our mind? The um, rules of morality, for instance, are uh, not hardwired directly in our brains, but are culturally transmitted and enforced. And different cultures have slightly different rules. But the underpinnings for that, I think, have a genetic basis. There is a, a long-term contradiction between science and spirituality. Science says that the matter is the main cause for all other invisible aspects of the human being, which are a later product of the physical world, following the evolution from simple to complex physical matter. And spirituality says exactly the opposite. Can we explain more about this antagonism? Well, I think it goes back to prehistoric times when there wasn't religion and science. There was just what everybody knew or thought they knew. There was the lore, the accumulated uh, knowledge and belief and fantasy of any group, any culture. This is what the elders taught the youngsters as they were growing up. And so if a father taught his son how to hunt, some of what the father taught the son was natural history, was biology, was how to, how to tell the difference between the plants and the animals and how to, how to harvest them and how to hunt them and uh, what they're called and, and, and so forth. But at the same time, the hunter taught his son which gods had to be sacrificed to before you went hunting for uh, uh, a, a, an elephant, let's say, and which gods were watching over you when you, when you picked the wild berries and so forth. And that wasn't religion, that was just more of the same lore. Over time, people began to realize that some of, this, some of these facts were not really true, or at least they were not provable, and they, uh, one could become skeptical of them. Now, here's where we get the first split, because when an elder says one thing and the young people see that, well, wait a minute, that's not what we're seeing. We don't see what you say we're, we're seeing. Um, this, the proto-scientist says, oh, I guess I'm going to have to change my theory. I'm going to have to abandon that idea. It's wrong. But the proto-religious, the proto-priest says, oh, you, you're misunderstanding what I said. Once you understand what I, what I meant, you'll see it's true. Hangs on to the, the claim by adjusting it, making it more mysterious, giving the words new meaning. Now, those uh, uh, acts of re-identification or re-invention, re-definition, uh, um, are frowned upon in science. Science is supposed to be refutable by evidence, but religion is never refutable by evidence. When evidence crops up that seems to refute what some priests have said about the, what the gods do, the priests always cover that up with further explanations of, but fantastic ones, of why the gods are not behaving the way the priests say they should. Uh, so there's a profoundly different set of motivations 
that drive the articulation of science on the one hand and religion on the other, and they come apart. And the scientific side goes on to uh, prove things with experimentation and reasoning, while the religion side uh, goes on to cover up and, and declare unprovable and uh, incomprehensible the various mysteries of the religion. Related to what you had just said, there is another thing which is a new concept and is called the God of the Gaps. Can you elaborate more? The idea of the God of the Gaps is actually, uh, the phenomenon has been around for hundreds of years, but the term is fairly recent. Um, people who are religious um, keep uh, looking for gaps in science, things that science can't explain, and that's where they say, ah, that's what we need God to explain that. Well, of course, science has explained many things, but it hasn't explained everything. And wherever science has not yet come up with a good account, that's where some spokespeople for religion will claim that this is where we need God, right here, to play this role. It's a um, uh, remarkably uh, undignified role for the religious apologists to play because they are in constant retreat and they have to keep changing their story. And as more and more uh, features of the world are explained, the role that they assign to God shrinks and uh, uh, transforms itself to where um, God has very little to do these days uh, except to be the sort of master of ceremonies or something like that. Do you think that the religious education in school has a positive or negative effect on the formation of students' correct beliefs about the world and the existence? Well, it depends on what kind of religious education it is. I am very much in favor of teaching in school about all the world's religions. I think this is a, a part of the, of the educational requirement for any informed citizen. They should know about the major religions, they should know about the history of religions, including the history of their own religion, whatever they were raised with. Uh, it should not be a, a, a place of indoctrination, it, sh it should not be a place of, of, uh, of uh, worship, it should be a social science, it should be like history and geography, and it should st study the art and music of different religions. Yeah, I think that has a wonderful effect because it demystifies religion and it removes centuries of falsehood from the lore of individual religions, mainly falsehood about other religions, but also sometimes about their own. Um, if instead the, the religious education is a sort of school done indoctrination in a particular faith, it's training up in a, a, a particular local religion, whether it's orthodoxy, uh, Christian Orthodox or Roman Catholic or, or Protestant, Baptist, whatever, uh, Islamic. This is, I think, uh, not only uh, uh, not to, to be not advisable, I think it, uh, it borders on child abuse because it distorts the minds of young, impressionable people and clouds their vision of lots of things in the world. And I think that is a, uh, uh, I think that is a very evil thing to do to young people. How do you envisage the future of the ongoing dispute between science and the neo-Christian, neo-creationist views, often referred to as Darwin versus God again and again? Well, I think, um, it is inevitable that, that sanity and science are going to win. The evidence continues to mount 
the creationists become ever more desperate in their propaganda, um, the levels of simple misrepresentation, outright lying that the, that the creationists engage in is, uh, takes one's breath away. But I'm an optimist about that. I think that, that uh, uh, lies uh, always ramify awkwardly and that in the end their falsehood uh, is apparent and those who have been telling the lies then uh, suffer the much-deserved loss of credibility and prestige that they have enjoyed. I sometimes ask creationist apologists, I say, aren't you worried that your grandchildren are going to look back on you and say, why did he tell us those lies? Why couldn't he handle the truth? Because I think they know their lies. But they, they figure they, they have nothing to lose. They're going to, they're going to tell the lies instead. If one considers the recent spectacular success achieved by science, what may explain this stream of medieval obscurantism? I uh, recognize that in your own country, in Romania, yes. you are um, suffering from a wave of, of uh, a sort of reinvention of, of the Dark Ages. And... Uh, Uh, a, a return to a sort of blinkered religious orthodoxy which um, uh, is extremely uh, unfriendly to science and will set the, the nation back terribly in its, in its uh, quest to be a 21st century nation that can hold its own in the rest of the world. Just when all other countries are um, opening up the minds of the young people and and relishing the new freedoms of of speech and the press, the internet lies there uh, just an unmatched tool of exploration, and this very regressive turn to uh, censorship and and indoctrination, I think it cannot work in the long run. I'm not worried about it settling in and uh, uh, succeeding, but I'm afraid that when it starts to fail, there are going to be violent repercussions. It's going to be, it's not going to be pleasant. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's a very unfortunate thing to have happened. Uh, why it happened, I'm not sure. It's a sort of overreaction to the uh, uh, totalitarian state that went before. Yes, the communist regime. But what were your impressions when you visited Romania knowing that these kind of things are happening? Well, actually, when I visited Romania, it was a few years back, and it was, Romania was still in the um, sort of blissful post Ceausescu uh, spirit, and it seemed to be a country with great optimism and uh, uh, with a new flourishing in the university, and uh, uh, in, in uh, the marketplace. So th this recent trend towards uh, sort of hyper-religiosity and return to orthodoxy is, uh, is something that I uh, was unaware of, and it's, I'm very sorry to learn of it. Something similar is happening in Hungary, I, I see, and uh, that's very distressing as well. So you visited us almost 25 years ago. No, just no, I visited after just after the fall of Ceausescu. What what year was 1990. that? 1990. That was 90. Well, my goodness. <laughs> that is almost 25 years <laughs> yes, ago. Yes. Yes. My goodness. It's how time flies. 
In an interview, the author and scientist Howard Bloom from New York told me that in his original books, Darwin spoke about the fact that the most important issue in nature which creates survi survivability in its cooperation and not fight. Those individuals among the same species which are better organized and coordinated have more chance for survival than the others less organized. Can you confirm this? Um, oh, yes, I think that and it's a very hot topic of research, the evolution of cooperation, uh, because on the face of it, it looks like a problem. It looks as if Darwinian evolution should uh, be always competitive and always uh, be arrayed against uh, friendliness and cooperation and uh, sharing and the like. But that doesn't, that turns out to be false. Uh, the conditions under which cooperation and altruism can thrive are becoming better and better understood. And the mere fact that we exist is, is a measure of that because uh, we're made up of several trillion cells and they cooperate quite well. We couldn't, we couldn't live if they didn't work together to keep us healthy and the, so forth. But um, uh, they all formed into this alliance, or their ancestors did uh, millions of years ago, in a, a, a great cascade of cooperation. So cooperation, we know it's possible, we know it's natural. The question is just what impediments to it do we see now in the human world? I was saying that because there are two different evolutionist currents, the Darwinist and the Lamarckism. Well, the Lamar Lamarck himself had numbers, numerous views. The one that is singled out and called Lamarckianism is one of his bad ideas. And that's about the uh, transmission of acquired characteristics uh, 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 characteristics acquired by individuals, uh, the idea that they could transmit them to their offspring directly. They can't, and the reasons for that are well understood, and there are various things that look like Lamarckian inheritance and that are important, but they're not Lamarckian inheritance. Uh, that is still uh, a fallacy. Lamarckism, in that sense, is still a heresy. But uh, whenever theorists uncover a new wrinkle, a new idea, a theoretical idea, which shows how cooperation arises or, or certain other uh, sped-up processes of evolution occur, they're inclined to over-dramatize them by, showing that, by saying that they have a proof that Lamarck was right that's never what they're showing. Uh, some of that's good and some of it's bad, but, I mean, not good science. Uh, but uh, uh, there is no serious disagreement over whether or not Darwinism or Lamarckianism is right. Darwinism is right, and, and Lamarckianism is just the name that some people give for uh, various challenges to Darwinism, which are, if they are plausible and, and promising, are not, do not have the Lamarckian feature. Yes, but do you agree with what Richard Dawkins spoke in a conference that we should not drive our society based upon the Darwinian law of the survival of the fittest? He said it would be wrong. Well, of course we should. Um, uh, uh, um, Darwinism does not advocate ruthless selfishness, um, and that social Darwinism is a terrible idea. It is a uh, degraded, cheapened, oversimplified descendant of Darwin's great idea, and we have to go to some length to... to alert people to this, 
since otherwise they tend to uh, uh, they tend to gravitate to this second-rate view. Yes, but this could create a confusion between what Darwin said about animal species and the human society, which is totally different. Yeah, well, it is. It's very different. Um, it's not totally different, but very different. And uh, you're right. Um, one of the educational or diplomatic problems that Darwin, Darwinian biologists have is clearing away the very familiar misconceptions of Darwinism that uh, whether some people hate them and some people love them and showing that, that those, that's just bad science. One last question. Can you tell to our viewers how should life worth living in order to stay healthy and happy and how to achieve more discernment between reality and illusion? Well, uh, that's a, um, a traditional philosophical task, telling people how to live their lives. I'm not very good at that. I just say find some cause more important than you are and devote yourself to it. Um, but by that, I don't mean religion. I think that the cause of, first of all, whatever cause you find, you should investigate it as dispassionately as possible. You should n make it a point of pride that you know about it in all of its manifestations. You know how it works, what funds it, what its aims are, because many people fall into positions where they are contributing unbeknownst to themselves to uh, campaigns, projects that, are, that they themselves would not approve of if they fully recognized what they were. And I think it's very important to know know the organization you devote yourself to, know it as transparently as possible. That's a good note on which to end, I think. I thank you so much. I, I'm sure our viewers will appreciate this wonderful talk that we had recorded for the first time. And let me know if you agree to do it once again next year. No promises right now, but I think probably that can be arranged. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I, was, I enjoyed talking with you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. În expunerile sale, profesorul Dennett explică celor curioși și neîncrezători următoarele. Există un suflet. Este alcătuit din 100 de trilioane de celule și nimic altceva. Iar aceasta este bine, pentru că suntem mecanisme biologice formidabile. Îmi place să închei și o să repet ceea ce am spus la finalul uneia din emisiunile trecute, și anume, știința este o cunoaștere aranjată și clasificată în conformitate cu adevărul, faptele și legile generale ale naturii. Știința, de fapt, este cel mai bine definită ca fiind o căutare atentă, disciplinată, logică, de cunoștință despre toate aspectele Universului, obținute prin examinarea celor mai bune dovezi disponibile și este întotdeauna supusă unor operațiuni de corecție și îmbunătățire pe baza descoperirii unor dovezi mai bune. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.